Hey, it's Mr. Veve, and this lesson is on the origins of cellular life. So let's get right into it with our first key concept. Many different forms of evidence support the theory that Earth is ancient and that species can change over time, and that's what we call evolution. So the next several videos will be about that topic, but let's first look at what evolution is. This is the theory that living things change over time. Yes, that is a theory. So what exactly is a theory? It's a scientific explanation uh, that is well supported by evidence. So it's not a, just a guess or a hypothesis. All right, there is evidence to show what these explanations actually mean. So and while we're on it, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a tentative and testable statement that is capable of being supported or not by evidence. So when you think about experiments that you do, you always have a question that you're trying to answer, and then as a scientist, you come up with a hypothesis, what you think is going to happen. And this is something that is testable in a way that gives you evidence to see whether or not your hypothesis was correct. Okay, so let's start talking about the origins of the Earth. So most scientists agree about a couple of things. They agree that the Earth is uh, billions of years old, and they agree that the conditions of the early planet and its atmosphere were very different than they are today. So it's really old, and it's really different than it was uh, than it is from today. So how did the Earth form? So about 4.6 billion years ago, and we know this by doing some carbon dating and looking at some rocks, uh, that's about how old we think it is. Uh, the Earth was actually not born in a traditional sense. It's actually... Uh, formed over time. So um, the Earth started forming and coalescing from all these different rocks, maybe uh, from asteroid impacts, but lots of things changed over time to turn it into the planet that it is today. So what happened in the early Earth is that heat uh, melted the elements that were on Earth and they got arranged by density. So you have um, the crust, the mantle, the outer and the inner core made up of different elements based upon density. So the most dense elements are going to be the ones found in the core and the least dense ones are going to be the ones that form the atmosphere. Now the early atmosphere had all kinds of stuff in it including lots of carbon dioxide and even water vapor. So water was actually only in the atmosphere in the early earth. It wasn't until about 3.8 billion years ago that we started seeing water in liquid form and that would be oceans covering most of the earth at that time. So not a whole lot of land just yet as we see. So let's start talking about a couple of different experiments and hypotheses that some uh, early scientists talked about. The first one we're going to talk about is primordial soup hypothesis. That's when Operin and Haldane had this hypothesis that the simple organic molecules, the thing, the, the form, uh, the building blocks of proteins could have formed in the conditions of that early earth, that really hot uh, and very unpleasant looking place. They think that actually you could have had some organic molecules formed there. So what happened is Miller and Urey, some other scientists in the 1950s, just devised an experiment to actually test this hypothesis of Operin and Haldane. So what they did is they created this a uh, really interesting looking apparatus. It's a model that they use to um, show the conditions of the early Earth. So they have a heat source underneath some water in the bottom left there. So the water would be the ocean, quote unquote, and the uh, ocean would be heated to produce water vapor that would then go into the atmosphere mixed with some other gases that they had. They actually had electrodes as well to actually simulate lightning. So a lot of the stuff that they had in the early, early days of the Earth were all there in that experiment. And actually what they found was really interesting. The experiment started producing organic molecules like amino acids, building blocks of proteins. So they actually proved that the original hypothesis was correct. In fact, that early Earth could produce some amino acids and some organic molecules. The other thing we're going to talk about here is the RNA world hypothesis. And this is the hypothesis that says RNA was the first nucleic acid, not DNA. And scientists think that this might be true for a couple of reasons. So catalytic RNA can self-replicate without additional enzymes. So that means there are certain types of RNA that can actually replicate itself and it doesn't need ligase, it doesn't need polymerase, it doesn't need any of that stuff. It can actually do it on its own. Another reason is that this catalytic RNA can make proteins without any additional enzymes either. So the RNA world hypothesis says that RNA came first because it would be able to replicate itself 
and it would be able to make proteins without any enzymes at all. They're saying that DNA came much later when enzymes were necessary for it. So let's now talk about life's origin. We talked about organic molecules in a couple of experiments, but now let's talk about actual cells, the first cells that we see. So after those oceans formed about 3.8 billion years ago, it took about another 200 or 300 million years for us to see the first cells form. So the main theory that we know of for um, the first cells, the first complex cells anyway, is something called endosymbiotic theory. So here's a good graphic for what endosymbiosis is in a nutshell. So you have two independent bacteria, two uh, uh, single cell bacterium, um, and along the way, somehow, one bacterium engulfs the other one, and that new bacterium lives inside the other one now, and they both benefit from this, so they decide, why not stay this way? So when that green bacteria that you see there starts replicating itself, well, it replicates the purple bacterium that it ate. And so this is kind of what uh, scientists thought of as early organelle development. So you have one bacterium that eats another, mutual benefit there, and so now you have a more complex system where you have one bacterium inside the other and uh, performing certain functions. So if we look here, this is the, the prevailing theory for how um, uh, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts, those sort of things, got into uh, eukaryotes. So we used to all have, uh, we used to all be prokaryotic cells, and then along the way, um, the uh, mitochondria, which was used to be its own bacterium, was engulfed by another prokaryote, and then it just stayed there because they had a, such a great relationship, and were able to both benefit from this relationship.